uh, to this beautiful New York City spring day. We finally have good weather today. Uh, in this world, uh, which right now has a lot of despair and uncertainty going on, it's wonderful to still uh, with us perseverance and hope. So it's wonderful to gather together today to uh, learn about and uh, dig deep into an uh, important topic. Uh, my name is Qing Gao. I'm a professor of social work and social policy at Columbia School of uh, Social Work. I also direct the China Center for Social Policy, which hosts today's event. Uh, it's my great honor and pleasure to welcome two of my very respected and highly admired colleagues and friends, Dr. Judy Smith and Dr. Manoj Pardasani. Uh, our topic today is a heavy one. We talk about mothering challenging adult children through conflict and change uh, through a cross-cultural dialogue. Uh, Dr. Judy Smith, who has this new book, which she will share with us, is a senior clinical social worker, a therapist, researcher, and professor at Fordham University Graduate School of Social Service. She is also a fellow of the Gerontological Society of America and a faculty scholar at Fordham's Revising Center on Aging and Inter Intergenerational Studies. Um, we also have Dr. Manoj Pardasani, who is a Dean and Professor at Adelphi University School of Social Work. He is a long-term clinician, practitioner, administrator, and scholar. So it's my great honor to welcome you both. I know separately before I invited you to speak to my students, always a great uh, pleasure to have you. And today we have the great uh, um, opportunity to be together. So next I turn to uh, Judy uh, for speaking with us for about 30 minutes, after which Dr. Manoj Padasani will offer commentary. So Dr. Smith, please, welcome. Thank you so much. And Chen and Manoj, it's wonderful to be together. We had many years together at Fordham and it's great to have these few moments together. Thank you so much for inviting me, Chen. It's really an honor. So I'm going to be talking to you about the research that led to my uh, writing this book. It's about mothers of adult children. And today's presentation, the way I'm organizing it, I want to share with you my understanding of this social problem that really has not yet been recognized, how older women have become the default caregiver for troubled adult kids. Um, and that older women are having to sacrifice a time that they thought would be for their own care and instead are worrying and <clears throat> actually many of them are living with very troubled kids. And then as the way I'm fr framing today's discussion is to talk about this both from a clinical issue and a policy issue because it really uh, points a finger to how the two are inseparable in this case. So what is known about mothering in later life? Um, when I got interested in this, I got older, surprise, and my son got older, and I was a child development person, and I was interested in the mother-child relationship, and I was curious what my colleagues had written about it as we aged. And I was shocked to discover so little attention to this. And most of the literature that did talk about older mothers and their adult kids focused on the mother as a as a burden to their kids, as someone who had to be taken care of. And I shifted the frame to really looking at mothers as providing care to their adult children in times of crisis. So most child development books look at um, parenting in terms of based on the age of the child. So if you go, remember we once had bookstores that we all used to wander and uh, there's, you know, 10 shelves on mothers of infants and some on mothers of school age, teenagers, there's still some, but mothers of adult children, it's not really there. Um, so when does parenting end? You know, legally in the United States, parental rights uh, are over at 18 or 21. You can no longer make legal decisions for your kids. They are considered their own entities. But my question is, from a mother's point of view, when does this active, active parenting end? 
So again, I have made the transition as a child development person. I spent years looking at the effects of poverty on young children and the mother-child relationship through a attachment lens. And then I shifted to becoming a gerontologist and started doing research on older women and how they are affected by their adult children. So I started a qualitative research project because there was so little research done on this topic. And I wanted to hear from mothers themselves about what, what, how were they affected by their kids when they grew up? I didn't know what they would say. You know, I went to senior centers, I went to uh, retired persons, you, you know, unions of retired persons, you know, where the, where the mom's going to tell me they were upset that their kids didn't call more often, they didn't visit more often, or is it going to be much more serious where all the mothers who are upset really actually being abused by the kids? I had no idea. For this conference, I tried looking at what's been written by Asian scholars on this topic, and there's really been I couldn't, in my quick and dirty way, could not find anything about older mothers as caregivers of their adult children. I did find a few uh, people talking about how older women, particularly in rural uh, parts of China, were affected by urbanization, all the young people moving to the cities, they're being left behind, how policies were trying to protect them because their kids were away. Uh, I found a few articles on elder abuse in China and people making a distinction that uh, Chinese elders, even though they knew what elder abuse was, they didn't think, nobody said that their own kid was abusing them. And similarly, I found the same thing in the United States. And then there's a small literature about the, by some feminists about the transnational decision of Chinese grandparents who come to the US out of a sense of uh, obligation to care for their adult children. And really they're providing unpaid childcare so that their adult children can succeed in this country. They're left with all kinds of tangled immigration policies that don't let them stay that long. And I actually did a small qualitative study with a young student with grandmothers who were providing childcare, uh, Asian Chinese grandmothers. And uh, we discovered that many of the women saw this as their contribution to pass down the Asian culture to their grandchildren. But several of them, when pushed, also talked about feeling um, that they were a burden, they did not feel appreciated, and couldn't look forward to when the kids were in college and they could go back home because they did not feel welcome and did not feel like this could be, become their home. So as we do when we do studies, you look at what else was done on this topic. Um, Carl Pillemer's work and his group has been very influential to me. They had used a large national uh, sample to look at parent and adult child relationships. And the things that they found was that parents were more depressed and had higher levels of ambivalence when their children were not doing well in certain ways. All because it was you know, short-ended questions, the things they could find is when the kids weren't married, when the kids didn't finish school, or when they, didn't, when they had problems with substance abuse or illness, the parents were much more depressed. So I began my study. I, it's a qualitative study, so it's a small sample for the research that's printed in several academic uh, publications. The sample size was 29 people. Once I started writing a book, I expanded it and spoke to over 50 people. But to be in the study, you had to have an adult child who the mother identified as having a serious problem. And I pre-screened them to make sure it wasn't that they didn't visit enough, that there was something else going on. And the adult child had to have had some period of independent living. So that means the moms in my study are not moms who from the birth of their child knew that this was be a lifetime trajectory of active mothering because the kid would not be able to take care of themselves. As a social worker, I began the study first with low-income moms. I was focusing just on women who were at less than 150% of the poverty line. 
And then I expanded, I did a second wave of the research to uh, middle class and affluent women. The cutoff was 300% of the poverty line, but I had several women who were quite affluent. I chose to do this in two interviews um, because I was aware that there was a lot of stigma to talking to people about problems in your kids' lives. And I didn't feel I could begin a conversation with someone say, tell me what's wrong with your kids. Um, I began to ask them about what was the pregnancy like, you know, what would they remember about their babies, which most of us have wonderful memories about our babies and our kids. And I got to know them this way in a way that they felt respected. They felt like they were good moms. And the second interview focused on the problem. So what did I find out? So it was not that they didn't visit enough. Uh, the problems that the moms were talking about uh, were upset that their kid did not reach their potential, that they were disrespectful to the mom. They were upset that their you know, marriages had fallen apart. They were upset that what they called that the kid was aggressive to the mom herself. Um, they did not use the word abuse. Uh, they were upset that their child was unemployed. They were upset that their child had no place to live. They had to live with her. People mentioned psychiatric illness and substance use. And as I really listened to the stories, I realized that mental illness and substance use were underneath all of those problems that are listed here. So the other thing that came across as I listened to all the stories and analyzed them um, was mothers feeling completely torn. That the base, baseline conflict was, is it who do I take care of, me or them? Whose needs matter? So what Pelimer called ambivalence, other people have called torn in two. And I heard that this was a daily decision that every mother faced is how long can I live with this, but how can I not live with this? So here's a 80 year old mom who I met, she had gone to get legal help to try to evict her 52 year old daughter and grandson because her blood pressure was off the charts. Her doctor had said she was at very high risk. She had to get rid of stress and the stress was her kids. She said, I'm still trying to help them but at the same time, I can't keep on leaving myself out. I have to help myself, but I'm at a crossroads. I have to stand up to them, but at the same time, I have to understand that they have real problems. And then I have to understand that no matter what, I wanna help them. I don't wanna give up on them. If I step back, something could happen to them and I'll be sorry that I didn't stay there. So we spoke for two whole sessions of an hour and a half each, and I knew she was not gonna kick them out, that her priority was that they be safe. So as I was listening to all of these interviews and the women's stories, I was trying to find a commonality across the stories. Obviously there were huge differences in terms of the adult children's problems, the mother's capacities. And when I came, the term that I came up with was difficult adult child. That it was different than saying her son was an addict. She was struggling with what to do with this child and he was causing problems with her because she was in conflict. Some colleagues said to me, you can't use the word difficult. It sounds like you're putting down um, the young people. Um, but I had to come to it. I felt that difficult might sound like a harsh label that seems to blame, but I felt that what I was hearing from this mother and the dictionary definition really supports what I was feeling. The dictionary says that difficult is when something is hard to do or carry out. Difficult is when something is hard to deal with, manage, or overcome. And difficult is something that's very hard to understand. And I think the take home message of this and sort of what I'm communicating, what mothers I think get out of reading my research and my book is they get acknowledged that mothering adult children who have these difficulties is very hard to do. And trying to understand their problems that have caused their situation is hard and knowing how to understand at times can feel really impossible. So if we're talking about adults with mental illness and substance abuse and their mothers, who in the United States is responsible for people with mental illness? 
we no longer have large psychiatric hospitals where people can be sent to spend the rest of their lives. We had deinstitutionalization, which most countries have. And even though parents are not legally responsible to take on the care for their troubled adult kids, what I discovered from each of these mothers that they each felt a pull, you know, in some ways morally, they felt, if not me, who? And isn't this what a mother does, that you step in when there's a problem? So clearly the linked lives that sociologists talk about was occurring here, that the problems of the adult child's life led to that they couldn't keep working, they had no place to live, and they turned, many of them turned back to their family. And the families allowed their adult child, and they thought it was temporarily, to move back in. But the research on elder abuse shows that having an adult child who has problems move back home is the highest risk for elder abuse. The most likely perpetrator of elder abuse is an adult child who has mental illness and or substance abuse and is living with their mother and father, but it's usually the victim is the mother. So here's Jillian, who's one of the more affluent people in my sample. She and her husband are professional people. They had the resources to put their daughter who had her first psychiatric break at 22. Uh, Jillian was 40 when her daughter had her break and she's now 76. So the last 36 years have been trying to find a safe place for her daughter to live. And she described it as, I feel like I'm a mule being held back by a harness. And the harness is wanting to keep her daughter safe. She would find her, she could afford to get her apartments, buy her apartments, but Celia's mental illness would erupt. She'd become paranoid. She'd destroy the apartment. She'd get evicted. So her mom had found her the first 20 years 21 apartments. Finally, she stopped doing that. But when her friend said, you can't keep doing this over and over again, she said, I have to. She, my daughter needs a place to live. She needs to eat. So as I listened to everyone, they all said, this is when she said, my daughter needs a place to live. She was being her mother. She was taking care of her. And I think we have here uh, in Western world, the ideology of being a good mother. And uh, Sharon Hayes in 1996 gave us the ideology of intensive mothering and the assumption that uh, good mothers made their child's interests their own and that the world's good parents were very child-centered. They used expert advice and did everything they could to create the best child that they could. And there's an assumption that the child's needs are the mother's needs. And I think many people are willing in our society to do that. But the question is, there's also an assumption that they're gonna move away. When they go to college, maybe I'll be able to travel. When they go to college, maybe I'll do this. But I think what I was hearing from these mothers is that this ideology continues and was really behind most of the decisions the women were making. And it was also interfering with the, their ability to take action when they were at real risk, when their child was not just disrespectful, but actually abusive and uh, putting their own lives in harm. So Doreen, who is 72, um, very tiny little woman uh, who had Parkinson's said to me, she, her son had his first break when he was 26 after going off to college. He needs, we need to be separated. I don't need all this on me at this age of my life, but I don't wanna see him have homeless or whatever because he won't survive. He won't survive. He will not survive. So that's what I feel, you know, that fear that there's harm is gonna come for him Harm could come to me too, but I just fear harm coming to him. So she's made the decision that her concern about her child is gonna override her own. Uh, her friends all said, get him out, throw him out. She was not gonna do that. I mean, she had gotten uh, police to be able to come in on random visits. So she, was, she wasn't crazy, but she was making sure that her son would not become homeless. 
So the kinds of stories people talked about, what was difficult about when your adult child moved in, I ended up, you know, qualitative research, we come up with themes. I call them boundary violations. Uh, examples moms gave is particularly the low income moms, the adult child would freely just take the mother's food. She's living on a fixed budget. The adult child would not use their disability money to bring in groceries. The adult child wouldn't respect the mother's need for privacy or cleanliness. And then it would get very extreme. Uh, one adult child, you know, use the court over and over again to try to have his own mother evicted from her home. And then violating boundaries really is what we call elder abuse. So people reported being physically knocked down by their kids. Doreen, uh, who I just talked to you about, had a knife pulled on her by her son. Another woman's uh, daughter in a psychotic break uh, tried to strangle her. Another woman's son came home to visit and stole her TV and jewelry for drugs. Um, and overall, some women who had less abusive kids felt upset. And I think this comes to what the Asian parents who talked were talked about when I, the research I read, is feeling disrespected in your role as parent. One woman says, he talks to me in a way that is totally uncalled for, like a little disrespectful. And it really hurts me. He seems to forget who is the parent and who is the child. And I ask myself, when is he really going to grow up and really act his age? So the caring for the mentally ill, is this, is this older mother's responsibility or is this a public responsibility? Who ought to be providing care for people who have serious problems? So I really began this study from my clinic. I'm Gemini and I have two sides to myself. And I really began this as a clinician, really wanting to understand mother's individual coping strategies with uh, difficult kids. But not surprisingly, as more I got into this, I realized that this personal issue was clearly a structural issue that we have a completely broken mental health system. We have no affordable housing. These mothers who said, I can't make my son become homeless. There is, she was right. I mean, the choice is homelessness, jail or her house. So we have no affordable housing for person. We have limited treatment. There is some, it's not none, but there's certainly not enough and it's not easily accessible. And then on top of it, we have such stigma still associated to mental illness and substance use. Although the United States has passed laws for parity for mental health treatment and health treatment, we do not in any way have that. And there's huge stigma about getting care. So even though I couldn't find uh, articles about their Asian mothers caring for their disabled kids, they clearly are disabled adults from the same issues that all my moms had. I mean, here's a picture of, you know, if we're talking about most of the adult kids in my group were between like 30 and 55. So the uh, largest uh, piece here is bipolar. Uh, then as kids get older, um, depressive disorders, we have um, anxiety disorders. So these problems are happening and maybe in the discussion, we can talk about what are the policies in China that's really addressing, uh, and alcohol use is way up here too, it's the red line. I tried looking at the stats on substance use, um, not surprisingly because of the harsh uh, criminal associations to substance use, um, it's a much lower prevalence in China, reported 2%, whereas here it's 15%. But how are the parents of those uh, people with substance use is being treated? In the, in the United States and other European countries, parents who have substance abusing adult children are at very high risk for theft, for violence. Uh, the kids come home, they want money, and they try to get it. Uh, so this is a daily struggle for parents. And some countries in the UK and other European countries are starting to shift their policies and putting the funding not just to the person with mental illness or substance use, but trying to give advice and support to the families because this is a family issue, having a 
a family member with an abuse issue. So clearly, while the literature showed that living together again is a risk for abuse, um, so many mothers and many of the mothers I spoke to were not willing to report it. Um, so is a mother who's experiencing uh, disrespect or punching or verbal abuse, there's this word we have, you know, many US people say, well, she's an enabler. Um, I have come to really hate that word. I think it's really not fair to talk about the much deeper issues that are, these women are experiencing. Uh, one woman, Hope, said to me, I feel trapped in this relationship that I'm not willing to give up. And unlike a divorce, when you can really give up the person, I just really don't feel able to give her up. And I was shocked uh, sitting with Rebecca is the first time somebody personally revealed to me her day-to-day -day fear of living with her son. She said, Brandon has bipolar. He can be very verbally aggressive, physical, breaking things. When I correct him, I become the enemy. I have to separate myself from him because if I don't, someday he's going to get so angry and someday he will kill me. So as a good social worker, I stopped the interview and said we had to make sure she was gonna be safe. And when I talked to the referring social worker who had sent her to me, she was in touch with social workers, but she wasn't cognitively impaired. And we do not have the right to stop people from making bad decisions if she does not have cognitive uh, impairment. Um, so I think parents and every mom that I talked to did not present herself. Nobody used the word abuse, even though half of them I recruited from JASA, from elder abuse centers. They did not see themselves perhaps as elder and they did not see what their kids were doing as abuse. Um, this was reported also by Yan in 2015 that, he, that Chinese older adults uh, would not call the interpersonal breaking of the trust with their kids as abuse. They just saw it as the kids being disrespectful. So I think in closing, what my work is telling me is that the wish to be a good mother continues till we die. And it really is underneath some of the conundrum of why people don't report more abuse by their adult children, why don't they don't reach out for help, why they become socially isolated, which becomes even more dangerous when you have a difficult adult child. So, you know, I got my doctorate in policy and, you know, there's always Sweden, we always would talk about as the dream world. And actually, they still continue to be ahead of us. Um, in 2009, they passed an amendment to the Social Service Act, which every municipality has to provide support to any person who's providing short-term or long-term care to someone with a disability. And it's written in the Social Security Act that it should be remembered that as a relative, you have no obligations to provide care or support to relatives, regardless of that relationship. This is all based on voluntarism. Clearly that's understood in our uh, culture as well, but I don't know if we have it written. And the idea that it's written maybe gives people a little less shame to ask for this help. And the kind of support they're offering is discussion groups with other parents. You can get a mentor to help you through uh, getting services. You can get uh, home care. You can get short-term housing. And every adult, whether they have a substance use problem or not, is offered uh, housing. In the United States, we're beginning to tackle some issues that uh, buttress this, we have elder justice initiatives in all states that are funded by the federal government. We're starting to have mental health courts in some prisons. So if somebody, I mean, right now, people with mental illness are either on the streets, in prison, or in their family's home. So there are mental health prison uh, courts where if the person's willing, they can be let out of prison if they're willing to take mandated uh, 
medication and if their mother is willing to attend uh, some elder abuse groups. We have adult protective services, but I think more and more what we need is, uh, there's a wonderful book by Tim Insel, the former head of the NIMH about healing. And he says, what we need in our mental health system is we have to provide people, not just medication, we have to give them access to the medication and early, but people need people, relationships, they need purpose, they need meaningful work, even if it's supported work, and they need a place to live. So I think this is where we have to go. And um, what I'm hoping is that you all will begin to start using the word difficult adult child. I think it allows mothers to have some hope. Difficult situations can be mediated and might get easier. It's not stigmatizing. And if you're interested, please join me. I want to find a way to reach out. There's many, many, many people in the United States who are struggling with this, who are living in secrecy. And I'm looking for ideas to how to reach them. So thank you. And here's how you can reach me. Thank you so much, Judy. This was fantastic. Such a powerful overview of your research and also the policy implications. Now it's my great honor and pleasure to invite Dr. Manoj Pardasani to offer comments and feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Chin. Thank you, Judy. What an exciting, interesting, um, detailed presentation um, on your research and, of course, the book that has been published as a result of your work. And, um, you know, it, you, you talked about where you are in your career, but it just seems like this is the start of a new chapter in your career and in your life. And there's, it just seems like a drop in the ocean. Uh, you know, you spoke to 30 or 40 folks, but we know that this probably impacts hundreds, thousands of families across the United States and globally. So, and thank you for having that sort of comparative piece between parents, uh, you know, from China, as well as families in the United States. And I think it gives us an understanding that certain experiences are universal, how people perceive things, how people react may be slightly different, but experiences of you know, family is universal. So thank you for this wonderful contribution to knowledge and to literature and research. Um, I had a few comments uh, based on your presentation and my uh, review of your book, which is just fascinating. So if any of you have not bought the book yet, it is available and you should get it right away. Um, it's, it's a fascinating read. And uh, for those of you who are involved in social work or social services or helping professions or just interested in this topic from a personal perspective, I think you will find a lot to learn and gain from here. Um, one of the questions that you started with, uh, Judy, really stuck out for me from the beginning. And I know you were talking about mother mothers, but I, uh, you know, what struck out for me was parenting, when does it end or does it ever end? And it doesn't end, you, you know, it evolves and changes through a lifespan of a parent, a mother and the child from being a child, an adolescent to an adult themselves, uh, but it doesn't stop. And the care, the worry, the concern, the love, the connection doesn't end because somebody turned 18 or 21. And so I think that uh, that is a really good question to ask. And I think sometimes in our popular culture, you know, we hear people saying, well, once they're 18, they're not my responsibility and they're out of the house. And other cultures might say, well, that's not true. But the truth is, once a parent, you're always a parent. You're always going to have that role. Maybe the nature of that parenting changes over the lifespan and what the context could be. I think what you mentioned about the stigma that people face is so critical. I think folks feel like they should be talking well of their adult children and, and grandchildren and be sharing, you know, uh, it's okay to complain about your spouse or partner <laughs> that they're driving you nuts or that they're doing something, but it just seems not okay to talk about your children in a negative way. Uh, and I think the stigma and the shame for people to even admit 
that they're dealing with a difficult situation or a challenging situation or a child who is giving them a difficult time is very hard. And, you know, but I think your idea of sort of having support groups and normalizing this experience and saying it does happen and we need to talk about it and we don't need to put a shroud on it will, I think is really critical to stop people suffering in silence in, you know, uh, the other things that I thought about that you were uh, you mentioned, and it reminded me, Judy, that you and I did this short study with Indian immigrant older adults, and we talked to them about their experiences. It wasn't quite about difficult adult children, but we talked, and one of the things that came out, I think, of that study was many of the older adults had immigrated to the United States to help take care of families because their adult children worked or went to school. So they were there to help with the grandchildren. But once the grandchildren were grown or didn't need that kind of parenting or caregiving, what was the role and purpose for that grandparent or the older adult immigrant? And in some cases, it was also the helplessness. They were dependent on their adult children, whether it was economically or whether it was because of transportation or access. And so I think that adds another layer with immigrant families perhaps is that if there's dependence economically or financially that may engender more abuse of some sort and a person is unwilling to speak up or ask for help. I think that you know our mental health system from the 70s on when we deinstitutionalized large psychiatric institutions because we found that they were not the best way for treating people with mental health issues or mental illness and disorders and even addictions was a good idea and moving services back into the community, reintegrating people with their families and communities was a great idea and still is. The challenge is the dollars didn't follow this wonderful philosophy. So we have people in our communities living in their, with their parents because they don't have access to adequate housing support services, access to appropriate healthcare services. And so I think that sometimes pushes people to be together and then there's no, you know, and it's kind of, it, it seems to me like it's a double-edged sword. You talked about, I think a couple of the parents who talked about feel fearing violence or danger from their own adult children. And nobody deserves to live in that sense. But it's almost like a double-edged sword because if they call the cops or law enforcement on their children, then the children then end up going to jail. Now they have a criminal record in addition to a mental health diagnosis that's gonna be even more difficult for them to find services, housing, employment, and so on. So that's part of it and then the part of the public shame that comes with asking for help or publicizing, making public. I think you're absolutely right. I think you quoted the former director of NIMH. We really need to invest in mental health and addiction services. They need to be comprehensive and they don't need to just focus on the individual that is experiencing it but their support system. If the family is responsible for taking care, then we have to provide support services for the family, not just the individual. And I think in our US system, we only think from an individualized medical perspective rather than that holistic. And I think social workers can bring that to the attention. And then the last thing that I was uh, going to add, and of course, I, you know, we, I'm sure we have plenty of questions from our wonderful uh, listeners and participants, I think we also need to think about social services for older adults. When we think of older adults, it's the population is growing. I'm probably speaking to a choir in this group today, but we're expected to go up to 83 million people over the age of 60, 65 in the next couple of years. And then this population keeps growing exponentially. So we're gonna have more older adults than people of any other age group. And when we think of older adults, we think of them as a monolithic group. Everybody needs the same things, but they don't. Everybody comes at it from different perspectives. There's a lot of demographic uh, you know, differences and diversity within the older adult population. And we, when we think of older adults as caregivers, we either think of them as grandparents taking care, care of grandchildren, which they do, some people do, or the caregivers for their partners or spouses. We don't think necessarily in social policy of older adults taking care of adult children, financially, emotionally, psychologically, socially. 
And I think our social services need to take that into consideration. Um, I'm from the world of senior centers and community-based services. And we do a lot of work with grandparent caregivers. We do a lot of work for caregiver support, but we don't focus on this population that you've identified for us that definitely and desperately needs the attention, the services, the resources to be able to function. So I think you've given us so much to think about. I, it's my head is spinning, but I'm gonna stop here. And again, thank you for your wonderful work that you're doing. And I'll yield the floor back to Dr. Chin Gao. Thank you, thank you, Manoj. Thank you so much, Manoj. Uh, Judy, you want to respond to any of the points mentioned by Manoj? Well, I would love to think with you, Manoj, about how we can bring this into senior centers. I mean, I think actually at the Queen Center, when we first started, I had had them put up posters, would you like to be in a support group? But people, the stigma is there. I mean, you see, this is this, we have to find, I think if we just do it about mothers, I mean, that's what I'm hoping we reframe it, get rid of abuse and, we have to normalize it rather than make it an issue. So I'd love to talk more. Wonderful. I also uh, really appreciated the many of the points, Manoj, you mentioned how to address stigma and shame, right? Really normalize this discussion. And mental health is uh, affecting everyone. It's no longer a mental health issue. People with mental illness, I mean, this pandemic made it so clear. We all are suffering uh, from all kinds of mental health challenges. Um, so I'm just deeply appreciative of both of you for these thoughtful uh, comments and the perspectives.